Hey Wolfpack and welcome back. How was your weekend? Did you do anything fun? I decided to go on a hike with my family, just today actually. So, that was quite fun. Yesterday it wasn't the best as we didn't really get much sleep. But anyways, onwards with what you came here for. So, today, we're doing three more hiking stories speaking of. So with that said, whether you're sitting around a campfire, on the night shift, or even laying in bed, let my voice soothe your nightmares. So, I love to hike, and so do my friends. We were always planning trips, and I even met my fiancé while hiking. One weekend myself, my now fiancé, and two other friends planned a trip to Irish Wilderness, Missouri. We saw photos of it and just had to go. A pretty hilly forest with all the greenery you want. One thing I distinctly remember was all the dark green moss everywhere, so we went. Before I continue, I must add that we were very experienced hikers. We knew everything about it too, from map reading, to how to catch, kill, and skin animals for food. So. This wilderness would prove no issue, we thought. We're at the trailhead and things were already kinda weird. There was a deer skull on the trailhead info board. At the time, it was more of a what the heck than any real alarm that we should have heeded. So we continued down the trail. We hike for a few hours, all the while we chat and joke around. All good friends. The trail is clearly defined as well. Marked with red spray paint dots every few trees near the trail. We are making a good pace. As we are talking, the pace setter, the person in front, stops. We all ask what is up, and she replies, Where's the trail? We began to look around, and sure enough, we were not on a trail any longer. What the fuck? I thought. We were not panicked at this point. Simply backtrack where we came from, right? Well, we did, for at least an hour, and no trail. No trail at all. It is noon at this point, and we took a break to gather ourselves and develop a plan. Since we were technically lost, we decided we could head down a saddle, a dip or low point along the ridge. The reason for this is because the water flows down. If we find water, then you will eventually find civilization, or what we are hoping, a trail. We found a creek that flowed down, so we followed. We followed for a good while until it drained off a cliff. And what do you know? There were tents down there. We found a way down and approached the tent saying hello. In retrospect, that was a very dumb decision, because there was no one. There were only two tents. A white two-man tent and a blue three-man tent. They were mangled and clearly been here a while. There were beer cans and food wrappers everywhere. Then, we saw what would really begin our fear for the remaining of the trip. Bullet casings and a deer carcass. Like a horror movie, one of my best friends and I look at each other saying, Poachers. Now, I know this may not sound like a big deal, but it really is. If you know anything about poachers, you know what they do is highly illegal. With that, you know what kind of people they are. Poachers would rather kill a human than have the human rat them out. Also, take them into account, we are literally in bumfuck Missouri. We just stumbled upon their camp and now we pose a threat. In perfect timing, it was a gunshot in the distance. We need to go, now! My friend says, and we began to run. We got out of the camp very quickly and began to walk in the opposite direction, but still no trail. But apparently... We were not far enough away because we heard a man say from behind, There was someone here! Run, run, run! Was all of our instinct. We hauled ass. The forest began to thicken, but we didn't care. We were hauling. Nightfall came rather quickly. Likely because of winter, we found a good spot to camp, but I suggested we only laid out our sleeping bags just in case. So, we went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to my friend covering my mouth. My chest pounded with fear, but he put a finger over his lips to signal me to be quiet. 
The others were already quietly packing their sleeping bags. I nudge him to tell me what is going on, but I came too. There was talking in the distance, and there was a light shining. It was them, those poachers. They somehow were able to follow us. How good are these guys at tracking? I thought. They were far enough away to have their speech inaudible, but I do remember one saying, This is dumb. We let them pass some 50 feet away, and we waited for the sun to rise. When the sun did come up, we began to move. We found a trail eventually, and ended up at the original trailhead. We got out of there very quickly. With all the fear I experienced that night, I am almost hesitant to say I liked it. I liked the rush, the adrenaline, to be hunted. I know it is weird, but that is my scary hiking story. It's been 10 days since my family and I have either been laid off, the case for me and my siblings, or forced to work from home, my parents' case, from the pandemic. We live in a rural town near the Rocky Mountains, and two weeks ago, we somehow had our first case despite being nearly in the middle of nowhere. My family has been surprisingly in good spirits, and my two dogs were more than happy to have our company 24-7. For the first few days, I didn't mind. I got more opportunities to work on projects and build my art and photography portfolios. On our sixth day, I noticed something strange in my area when I went to take a walk and take some photos. Our backyard juts into the foothills and onto hiking trails claimed by our town. I always use the trails for photos, either capturing the beautiful landscape shots my area provides, or, if I'm lucky, animal photos. The fence in my backyard is old and tall, at least seven feet. The gate creaks every time I open it, scaring off birds and rodents pretty much without fail. You can tell by the rustling of the trees and bushes. What made it already feel like an off day is that nothing made a sound when I opened the gate, and it made that god-awful noise. It just echoed into the wilderness, then absolute silence. Eerie, but didn't think anything of it like a moron. I could hear every crunch of branches and leaves that I stepped on better than I could ever before. I wasn't going to be long, as it was getting late, and I had to go eat dinner soon. Another red flag was that I didn't see a single soul on the path. It's normally got a few people on it, and thanks to the virus bringing out the stupid in people, it usually had plenty of folks blocking the roads, not practicing social distancing, or anything like that because it was the countryside. I didn't think of this as anything bad. In fact, I thought it was a blessing. I was jogging upwards, still only hearing me and me alone, to a lookout spot that is normally littered by tourists and hikers alike, seeing it was clear from below. I was somewhat out of breath upon reaching the lookout point, sucking in air with some light wheezing. I took in my view, and the setting sun shone upon my town, and I didn't need to worry about the sun getting in my shot. As I prepared my camera, I heard a sound that still makes me shudder to this day. It was the sound of my gate opening up, off tune, coming from a dip in the path on my right. I was no longer alone. Branches snapped as I heard what sounded like something shuffling around on the ground, coming from the same area. I knew it was no echo. Whatever made that sound did it again, and my head snapped in the direction of the noise. I couldn't make out much as it was rapidly getting darker, but I saw something hunched over on all fours, with bone-thin limbs thumping the ground around it. I decided that was enough and ran all the way to my house. I heard the thumping sound in the distance, but not very close, thankfully. I slammed my gate shut and caught my breath. I saw my family staring at me through the window, looking a bit concerned. I bolted inside and locked the doors and covered the windows. My dogs went crazy, hair raised on both of them. I did my best to hush them, as they knew something was wrong though. Good dogs they are. I explained what I saw and what I heard to my family, but the only one who actually took it seriously was my older brother. He had always believed in cryptids. He gave me flack for not taking photos of the beast, but I was honestly too scared to at that moment. It was fight or flight instincts that took over me, and I wasn't planning on fighting it with a camera. I got one of my dogs to sleep on my bed with me that night, to alert me if anything happens. 
as well as the standard emotional support. I got Seed, my pit bull. She's normally docile and loves nothing more than to cuddle, but considering she went bonkers when I got home, I figured she would have been a perfect watchdog. My room is upstairs, and I cracked my window open to see if I could catch a glimpse. I had my doubts this creature could climb. My brother told me to call him on his cell phone if we saw anything, as he was going to be drinking and Skyping his friends downstairs. I already had a hard time falling asleep early that night, but I managed. It was short-lived, however. At about 12.20 a.m., Seed started to growl. It was low, but it was enough to wake me up. I saw her head facing my window instead of me. She was sitting up. I gave her a kiss and hushed her, and she quickly went back to growling. Getting extremely nervous, I cocooned us in my blanket and slowly crept towards my window. I didn't initially see anything in the backyard, yet it didn't take long before I heard something from outside. It was my wheezing from earlier, or at least an imitation of it. It was definitely louder than I was doing it up at the lookout point. I frantically scanned the yard, looking for the source of the sound. Seed was growling louder now, which didn't help the situation at all. I noticed something moving alongside the fence, on the other side of the property, at the base of my window. All I could make out was something crawling, with bone-thin arms and legs. It was a bright color. My guess, it was gray. Hard to tell at night, though. I laid back on the bed, not wanting to be seen, and called my brother. He picked up immediately, and I quickly explained to him what I was seeing. Within a minute, he had hung up on his friends, shut down all the lights downstairs, and was up in my room. I urged for him to crawl so he wouldn't be immediately spotted in the window. I could tell he was nervous as well. After hushing the dog once more, my brother could make out the eerie sounds the thing outside was making. I had noticed a pungent smell starting to waft into the room. I suspected it was from this thing. Silently, my brother urged me to close my window, something I probably should have done sooner. I made an effort, but the cold night had caused the window to go stiff. It let out a squeak before it shut. Unfortunately, it was too loud because the creature heard it. We watched as this thing stood upright. It was at least a foot taller than our fence. It was a humanoid in shape, with wrinkly skin and mangy hair patches. Its head looked like a human's, but bald, with almost bat-like ears and a mouthful of jagged, crooked teeth. Its jaw was slacked and a long tongue hanging out. It was drooling on the fence. It was fixated on my window. My brother and I hid back, both doing our best not to scream or cry. Seed began whimpering though, thrashing as my brother muzzled her with his hands. I heard Rocket, our other dog, go crazy downstairs, barking at the back door and pawing at it. I was tempted to go down there and bring her up here when I heard the sound of wood creaking and I frantically closed the curtains. I noticed it looked brighter outside suddenly and I heard a familiar click sound, like that of a flashlight turning on. I formed a peephole with the lower part of the curtain against my brother's decision and took a look outside. A motion light tripped, revealing this thing even better. Its eyes were black, with a glint of light reflecting from the motion lights. Made them look like obsidian balls. His torso had breached onto the top of the fence, and with one arm touching the grass in our yard. Holy shit! The claws on it weren't large, but were caked in dried blood and definitely sharp. It was no longer looking at us, but at the light. It covered its eyes and let out a shriek that sounded halfway between a cougar scream and a sheep's cry. It slunk back and I watched it crawl away into the bushes. I had a gut feeling it wouldn't return that night, and thankfully it didn't. I didn't end up sleeping much at all that night. I made sure to spoil Seed for the next few days to make up for rudely having to muzzle her so much. I went out the next morning to look at where it was. The drool it left was there and smelt absolutely vile, like compost you'd forgotten to take out for several months mixed with expired milk. The fence looked like it was in stable condition at least. My brother wishes we had captured it on camera. It dawned on me that my father has one of those motion capture trail cams that people use to document wildlife. I'll have to dig it up myself, as I doubt he'd let me use it for a purpose he didn't believe in. There had been talk around the neighborhood yesterday of strange noises coming from the woods. Foolish hikers that really should have stayed home still. Report hearing cougar cries and sheep cries to our local ranger. 
Whatever this thing is, it's definitely getting more comfortable around these parts with everyone staying inside due to the pandemic. I've been going out less and less on those trails, and I stopped going altogether during sunset. I don't want to take any risks now. I've been leaving lanterns out on our fence to deter this monster. I know it's still out there though. Last evening, just after sunset, we all heard the off-tune creak of our gate echoing in the distance. When quarantine started, I, like a lot of people, started to go stir-crazy after a few weeks of being primarily stuck indoors. The idea of binge-watching another show or reading another book made my eyes hurt, and the fresh air from a cracked window or my weekly grocery store trip was no longer cutting it. I needed something sustaining. I needed to be able to feel like there was more to the world than my tiny apartment at Walmart. So I chose to start hiking. I'll say this, it is a lot harder to stay socially distant on a hiking trail during lockdown than before lockdown. The parking lots are packed and the families are large. On the day in question, I had managed to squeeze into the last spot which earned me a dirty look from a father of a sizable family that would have now have to park near by Burger King. I shrugged and grabbed my pocket knife from the back seat. The fresh air and openness of the trail gave me life. It felt heavenly. My heart pounded thinking of what I would find on the trail today. Originally, when I had first started hiking, I stuck to the paths worn through the woods by hundreds of feet and that sustained me for a few days. When the thrill wore off from that, I started to notice the smaller ones. Ones made by tens of feet, not hundreds. Ones that led to special spots. When I found new hidden trails, I would find hidden treasures with them. One led to a shallow cave miraculously devoid of trash, but filled with graffiti of hearts and names. Locks of mismatched hairs were tied to twigs beneath them. Another was an abandoned resting bench overgrown with ivy and vines that had begun to bow inward with weather and time. It had no markings though. It seemed as if one day it was left here and remained untouched as the years grew on. Despite these small treasures, I still eventually wore them out. The bench became less magical when I found beer cans around it. I started noticing condoms discarded in the cave, and the paths to those areas grew worn and beaten like the main paths were, until they were just unofficial stops on the trails through the woods. That's when I started to make my own. I would find a section of the woods that didn't seem too overgrown. A gathering of large trees was always a good sign. When I felt I had found a spot worth building, I started to cut. I wore my running shoes and shorts the first time I tried it and waddled into a patch of poison ivy. I kept Quaker Oats in business for weeks after. When I returned, I had dressed in jeans and boots to stomp away the plants. If a fledging tree was grown into the path, I would cut it away. If it was too big to cut, I would tie it back. I had created a few arcs of trees using that method and began to do most of them like that. I never found anything too special except for a piece of my own personal paths. Paths that kept growing and sprawling and I could feel would lead somewhere soon. As I finished pulling up a small sapling that hung too low for comfort, I stood back and admired my work. Bent trees and plants dotted my paths and sight of the trail was long gone. I had a wide grin on my face for the first day I realized that. I turned back around and looked forward for the next direction on my personal trail, and that's when I spotted it. An honest to god log cabin overgrown with vines and caved in on one side. When I first saw it, the sight of it was so incongruous to what I was expecting that it felt out of place. But when I blinked, it didn't disappear. It stood true in the center of brush and branch. I took in a breath and did all I could not to scream with excitement. I had done it. I had found my own special spot in the woods. Somewhere no one knew about. Somewhere that had been abandoned so long that no one may have known about it for centuries. I fought the urge to run over to it and maintained my practice of cutting a path through the bramble around me. I had to preserve this place and find my way back, of course. When I finally reached the front door, my muscles ached and my heart pounded. The mildew smell of old pine and dry rot filled my nose. I pulled at the handle. It screeched out a song of iron and wood, and only for a moment, I jumped back. 
I gathered myself and took my first step into the leaning wooden shack with a trembling foot. Mold and weeds had carpeted the floor and crawled up the doors of the cabinets and table. Flowers bloomed outside the kitchen window on ropes of vine that were fighting a decades-old battle to eat the surrounding frame. Scraps of cloth and bowls set the table. Just beside, heaps of blackened stone gave way to dots of light where the chimney had caved in and broken through the floorboards. To my right were two doors. Inside the first, a rotted mattress lay on a wooden frame with mushrooms growing on both, and a cloth doll in the center. The doll looked bound to the bed, as though it was sinking in quicksand made of foliage. In the other, I found them. The shattered skeleton held two smaller items in its arm. It wore a dress with a large single tear in the front, and a smattering of brown down the middle. Its empty sockets and jaw seemed to gape in disbelief at the hole, unable to come to terms with her own mortality. The two smaller skeletons draped off of her arms, uninterested. Two rows of teeth on each jaw and cracks along their yellow domes. They sagged in opposite directions, though, one toward the door and the other toward the bed. I felt my legs go numb and tried to look away, only to lock sockets with a swinging skull tied to a rope from the rafters above. Its body lay in a heap below. Behind it, an axe leaned against a wardrobe tied shut with rope. Be it morbid curiosity or something darker that drove me deeper into the room, I walked forward. I tiptoed around the bodies, so wide and empty they seemed to watch me as I violated their privacy. I cut the rope and pulled the wardrobe open. Inside, Three jars filled with a black tar substance stood behind a large, leather-bound book imprinted with a cross. I picked it up and flipped through the pages expecting a Bible. There were no words inside, no English words at least. I would have read further, but something brushed my shoulder. I turned, and she tilted her skull. Her teeth clacked together as though she wanted to speak. I was frozen as I looked eye to socket with her. Her bony hand moved from my shoulder to the cheek as her jaw clicked. I looked at where she had lain, and the children were gone. I felt a grip of wooden bone around my throat, felt it pierce my skin, and I came back to control of my faculties. I ran. I pushed her, and the arm remained with her behind. I heard small rattling clicks from behind and yanked her hand free of my neck and threw it back. I pushed into the living room. The little boy and girl clicked their double-rowed jaws at me and cocked their head from side to side. As I turned towards where I had come from, I heard the sound of them running toward me like a deafening roar of motion in the otherwise silent room. Still, they were skeletons. I had to be stronger and faster than such long dead things. I flung myself from the door and looked back only once to see the yellowed ivory shapes lurking and jerking toward me. I could not hear them in the silent paradise I had carved for myself. I only stopped running when I broke into the main trail, even then only briefly. The brush behind me rustled and I bolted to my car, only then realizing I still held the book. I flung it into my seat and peeled out to come home. For the past few days, all has been quiet. For the past few days, I've spent every waking hour calling a museum and universities about the book. For the past few days, I've been dismissed as a lunatic, but I'm holding the book right now and I feel sane. I feel almost too sane. Some of the pages are even beginning to make sense to me. I need three quarts of blood for something. I'm not sure what, but I hope it ends. The tapping I hear on my door. I haven't left my apartment in days because all I hear is tapping outside, and I'm not sure what will happen when I let them in. Thanks for listening, Wolfpack. If you want to submit your own story, the links for my email and subreddit will be down below. I've also created a Discord, so if you want to join that, the link will be in the description down below as well. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And with that said, have beautiful nightmares, and I will see you next time.